So we talked about an alleged acoustic levitation technique in the ancient world, interpreted from various legends of antiquity. Macro levitation is usually associated with electromagnetism, buoyancy, or aerodynamics rather than sound, allowing small to heavy objects to be raised from the ground. But unlike the former methods, there are different types of acoustic levitation. One is the one in which we are most familiar with, used in modern containerless processing. This method allows an, a small object to float in the nodal region created by the interference pattern of two or more waves. Another type is the recent acoustic tra tractor beam device, which uses an acoustic vortex. This vortex created by 52 miniature speakers enables the flotation of objects that are normally too big to lift and hold using the interference pattern method. The acoustic vortex has also been postulated on a megalithic scale in the well-known Tibetan levitation account. Still, another method involves vibratory lift, such as that coined by inventor John Ward Keeley, in which the particles of a mass are allegedly vibrated at high enough frequencies that they can seemingly repel or become dislodged, as it were, from gravity, enabling objects of practically any weight to float in the air. But some of the other legends point not to full levitation, but instead to the use of sonic energy to induce a temporary loss of weight, significant enough to allow a mass to be lifted with considerably less effort. This principle could be termed sonic levity. We briefly mentioned the concept of high-frequency phasing as relates to alter apparent weight. In a more recent video that was entitled, I Suspend All Gravity with a Wire, there are a few anecdotal examples of this levity principle from ancient times, as well as from, from more recent times. Let's take a look. It says here that the ruins of Tiwanaku near Lake Titicaca in Bolivia include blocks weighing around 100 tons, which were transported from port quarries 50 kilometers away. According to the local Amira Indians, the complex was built at the beginning of time by the founder god Viracocha and his followers, who caused the stone to be carried through the air to the sound of a trumpet. An alternative theme is that they created a heavenly fire that consumed the stones and enabled the large blocks to be lifted by hand as if they were cork. The former variation describes levitation while the latter describes a principle of levity. Apparently, Philadelphian inventor John Ward Keeley also experimented with levity. The following account says that one of Keeley's little scientific experiments is to put a small wire around an iron cylinder that weighs several hundred weight. I believe this means several hundred pounds. And when the force runs through the wire to lift the cylinder upon one finger and carry it as easily as if it were a piece of cork. Not long ago, he moved single-handed a 500-horsepower vibratory engine from one part of his shop to another. There was not a scratch on the floor, and astounded engineers declared that they could not have moved it without a derrick, which to bring into operation would have required the removal of the roof of the shop. Another case involves an Austrian named Lenauer, who stated that while at a remote monastery in northern Tibet, during the 1930s, he had witnessed the demonstration of two curious sound instruments which could induce weightlessness in stone blocks. The first was an extremely large gong, three and a half meters in diameter, composed of a central circular area of very soft gold, followed by a ring of pure iron, and finally a ring of extremely hard brass. When struck, it produced an extremely low dump, which ceased almost immediately. The second instrument was also composed of three different metals. It had a half oval shape like a mussel shell. It measured two meters long and one meter wide, 
with strings stretched longitudinally over its hollow surface. Lenauer was told that it emitted an inaudible resonance wave when the gong was struck. The two devices were used in conjunction with a pair of large screens positioned so as to form a triangular configuration with them. When the gong was strung, struck with a large club to produce a series of brief low frequency sounds, a monk was able to lift a heavy stone block with just one hand. Lenawa was informed that this was how their ancestors had built protective walls around Tibet and that such devices could also disintegrate physical matter. But as fascinating as, as these accounts are, they are still anecdotal and can't really be verified. Have more contemporary observations yielded results that are similar to these, cam these claims? Or would it at least imply that these accounts have some validity? Let's start with a look at the work of Russian astronomer and astrophysicist Nikolai A. Kozirov. Kozirov developed the theory of causal mechanics, a theory which postulates that time, along with duration, has actual physical material properties that can create a difference between causes and effects, due to which it affects the bodies and processes of our world. It further says here that the study of the physical properties of time was enthused by the search for an answer to the question of stellar energy origin. Kozura's work led him to the conclusion that there are no internal sources of energy inside of stationary stars. Based on the law of conservation of energy, he concluded that stars draw their energy from the outside he further concluded that, since stars exist everywhere in the universe, this source of energy must be as universal as the universe itself, suggesting that time itself was that source. Of course, today, the process of nuclear fusion is given as a source of stellar energy. But is it possible that both postulations could be true? Kozirov ultimately summed up the theory of into three main axioms. Number one is that time has a special property that creates a difference between cause and effects, which can be called directionality or course. This property determines the difference between past and the future. Number two is that cause and effect are always separated in space. And number three, that causes and effects vary over time. After Kozirov's death, his ideas were found to be fruitful in the physics of quantum information, the physics of irreversible processes, geophysics and solar terrestrial physics, as well as meteorology. But curiously, it's not generally considered a sufficiently proven theory by the mainstream scientific community. Kozirov believed that time itself was the source of gravity a concept that mirrors an aspect of the modern theory of gravity as being due to time dilation, as discussed in my video, Gravitational or Gravitic Levitation. Kozirov envisioned time not as a static quantity, but rather as a spiraling energy flow. Other names for it have been ether, torsion fields, or torsion waves. In 1913, Dr. Eli Cartan was the first to clearly demonstrate that the fabric or flow of space and time in Einstein's general theory of relativity not only curved, but was also possessed of a spinning or spiraling movement within itself known as torsion. To test his theories, Kozirov engaged himself in a number of experiments, observing that subtle apparent weight changes due to disruptions of this time flow could be created by simple movements, including the dropping or deformation of a physical object, friction, burning, rotation, the heating or cooling of an object, all actions which could be categorized as functions of vibration. Kozirov developed analogies to understand this property further, both involving a sponge. An analogy to understand his observed decrease in weight could be understood as a submerged, saturated sponge 
which is squeezed, cooled, or rotated. This will cause some of the water inside of it to be released into its surroundings, decreasing its mass. But once the sponge is no longer disturbed, the pressure on the millions of tiny pores is relieved, causing it to reabsorb water from its surroundings and expand back to its normal resting mass. Conversely, the observed increase in weight could be understood as the action of pumping more water pressure into said sponge in its resting space, uh, state, such as by heating or vibrating it, thus causing some of the pores to expand with more water than they can normally hold. In this case, once the added pressure is relieved, the sponge will naturally release its excess water and shrink back down to its normal mass. And so though it would seem impossible to most, Kozarev showed that by shaking, spinning, heating, cooling, vibrating or breaking physical objects, their weight could be increased or decreased by subtle but definite amounts, thus mirroring Keeley's alleged levity and supergravity experience, albeit on a much smaller scale. In the realm of causal mechanics, since both heating and cooling are functions of vibration, then depending on how an object is vibrated, its weight can be caused to increase or decrease. In one of his experiments, the mass of a 620 gram weight was slightly increased by subject, subjecting it to high speed vibrations. Now the main curiosity in Kozarev's vibration experiments in particular is that set vibrations seem to cause an increase in apparent weight rather, rather than the expected decrease. This may be because at first glance, vibration seems to be equated solely with heating instead of with both heating and cooling. As we know, vibration is not always associated with heat or vice versa. We can see this with the evaporation of water. There's the more familiar hot evaporation normally associated with boiling, but there's also cold evaporation which can occur via ultrasound. So we could postulate that at least certain orders of sonic or mechanical vibration might cause the cooling effect on the analogous sponge that Kozirev described. This would lead to the corresponding weight loss, while heat vibration would lead to the weight increase or supergravity effect. It is also worth noting that Keeley reported a cooling effect of the local air when his anti-gravity effect was in operation, according to alternative researcher Jerry Decker. And both cooling and heating effects reportedly accompanied Nikola Tesla's own levitation experiments. Kozarev also recorded a loss of 100 milligrams of weight in a gyroscope, which was both rotating and vibrating. It says here that a gyroscope that was vibrating, heating, or conducting electricity would su substantially decrease its weight when it was rotated in a counterclockwise motion, whereas it would remain unchanged if it were rotated in a clockwise motion. Kozarev concluded that this was caused by the Coriolis effect, where an object would indeed show a rotational movement as it is dropped towards the surface of the Earth. Ultimately, this is due to the subtle spiraling pressure of torsion that is imparted to the flow of ether gravity as it rushes into the earth, upholding the existence of all atoms and molecules. If the vibrating gyroscope is moved in a counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere, it is moving in unison with the counterclockwise current of the Coriolis effect. This causes the object to absorb some of the energy that would normally be pushing it down and a small but definite decrease in weight is then measured. In these particular gyroscope experiments, it seems that vibration is differentiated from heating and cooling, instead referring to some type of low frequency mechanical vibration. Though either seems to produce a loss of weight when paired with the counterclockwise rotation of the gyroscope. These apparent discrepancies are curious and hence will require independent experimentation to truly sort out. But ultimately, Kozarev's experiments describe micro-effects. How could we take Kozarev's cosmology and figure out how to produce macro-effects for full-scale levity or levitation? 
This brings us to another scientist by the name of Dewey B. Larson. Dewey Larson was an American engineer and author who was born in North Dakota and grew up in the Western United States. He developed a reciprocal system of physical theory, also known as RST. It says here that the reciprocal system of physical theory is a system in which the properties of all physical entities, from the photons of radiation to subatomic particles to the atoms of elements to galactic clusters, are deduced solely on the basis of the assumption that the universe consists of nothing but motion. This as opposed to the conventional assumption that the universe consists of matter contained by space and time, as in quantum theory, or consists of an interaction between matter and space-time, as in general relativity. Larson's reciprocal system cosmology, as its name implies, focuses on the reciprocal nature between two aspects of reality. One is the physical reality, or framework one. This is also known as the space-time that we are familiar with. The other is the metaphysical reality, or framework two. This is referred to as time-space, the reciprocal of space-time. The comprehensive basis of the reciprocal theory is that all is motion. There are no solids. Rather, what we perceive as atoms and particles are simply frequencies and harmonics. In other words, vibrations, a concept noticeably similar to contemporary st string theory. Other foundational staples of Larson's reciprocal theory are that photons are vibrations or fluctuations of energy, and that atoms themselves are conglomerations of rotating, oscillating photons that harmonically resonate. Light is the carrier of the messages of time. And also, time is not a single dimension, but rather has three dimensions. The three modes of the time of time include the, the circular, linear, and spiral flows, the latter in particular being reminiscent of Kozarev's concept of time. The article further states that linear time, or the arrow of time, is the mode we are most familiar with. It is the one we experience in our waking life. It is one dimensional. To our physical earthly perception, it does point in a fixed direction, yet we only see half of what is happening. Physics requires the existence of another half of the universe, a non-material or metaphysical sector, which in all respects is the inverse of the material sector. This is the unseen metaphysical realm referenced earlier as framework two or time space. In that other half, the metaphysical, the arrow of time points in the opposite direction and all the effects of the unidirectional progression of time in our material region are completely nullified in the long run by the absolutely directed progression in the non-material realm. Larson postulated that time in the metaphysical realm was three-dimensional, dubbing it coordinate time. A fluid-like electromagnetic resonating ether flowing into and out of each other, oscillating back and forth just as a torus. Movement or time in one reality becomes fixed position or space in the other. Hence there is a perfectly reciprocal relationship between space and time as there is a constant fluid light exchange between the two. Photons are constantly flowing in and out between the two realities. This is reflected in the fundamental sy symmetry of particles and antiparticles in quantum mechanics. And so in this case, the virtual particles set by quantum physics to blink in and out of existence actually do not disappear into nothingness. Instead, they teleport back and forth between these two realities. And so how does the work of Kozirev, Larson, and others tie in with anti-gravity? Well, starting with the basics, all particles in an object are in a state of constant harmonic motion. At the most minute level, they are not solids, but instead are units of vibration and rotation. And so when we input energy into any harmonic system at its resonant frequencies, or its mass core as Keeley would define it, 
then we greatly increase the energy of that system. It is likely that many of the higher frequency harmonics also come into play. And when this happens, some of the particles which makes up the object attain the next higher energy level, rendering them able to temporarily cross over from t space and time to time space, similar to the aforementioned virtual particles of quantum physics. In other words, the object partially dematerializes because of some of its particles now exist within the parallel real reality of, of time space. There is less mass for gravity to pull on in space time. Going back to the variation of gravity as an etheric push, some see levity as the result of vibrations, essentially sh shaking off some of the etheric flow and diverting it around the mass. Other alternative postulations still maintain gravity as a pull. But either way, in the RST model, the facing of the masses particles into another dimension will theoretically have the same effect of levity and or levitation. There will be fewer molecules for gravity to pull down or fewer to push down. Either way, resulting in the object weighing less than it does under normal conditions. Now, generally, this weight loss may be imperceptible or only quantitatively obvious with the use of very sensitive weighing equipment, as in Kozier's novel but relatively inefficient method of brute force. The actions of smashing, shaking, cooling, and heating, etc., apparently energize only a very, very small percentage of these particles, resulting in weight changes that are barely noticeable. However, when sound vibrations are tuned to the object's resonant frequencies or chords, then a state of harmonic coherence can be created in which significantly more particles can now enter this higher energy state and thence cross over the barrier into time space. And as with Kozirov's experiments, the object eventually regains its original weight as the particles in time space lose this higher energy state and cross over back into space time. This residual effect is also known as the latent effect, a condition which Keeley also noted, and which was also implied in the Tibetan levitation account by Jarl, in which it took several minutes of continuous sound until initial levitation was achieved. It is also apparent in the second Tibetan sonic levity account by Lanauer, in which the loss of apparent weight subsisted after the gong's vibrations faded away, enabling the monk to be able to easily move and lift a heavy block with one hand for some time. There are three videos from a YouTube channel called Open Your Reality, which further discusses the reciprocal theory and the concept of three-dimensional time that I highly recommend. Links to the videos are in the description below. Now the idea of an object rotating or vibrating at high enough frequencies or speeds such that it could become partially or fully immaterial, and thus partially or fully weightless, is also mirrored in the summum principle of vibration, and to some degree in the account of the Philadelphia experiment. Concerning frequency in particular, we may recall the book Anti-Gravity in the World Grid by David Hatcher Childress, that gravity itself seems to be assigned to a certain frequency. According to this, the frequency of radiated gravity is 10 to the 12th, or 1 trillion hertz on the electromagnetic spectrum. Below this frequency is the spectrum band that is used for radar and conventional radio. Above it are the infrared and optical frequency ranges. And so the question might be, would an object vibrating in the range of 10 to the 12th hertz become heavier due to this radiated gravity? Or would it become lighter due to the radiated anti-gravity? And looking back at the previously mentioned summum principle, it states that when the object reaches a certain order of vibration, its molecules disintegrate and resolve themselves back into the original elements or atoms. Following the principle of vibration, the atoms are further separated into the countless particles of which they are composed. As the frequency increases still, even those particles disappear, and the object may be said to be composed of the quintessence or primordial essence. In summary, 
Some of them teach us that if the vibration be continuously increased, an object would mount up the successive states of manifestations of matter and would in turn manifest the various mental stages, continuing on until it would finally re-enter some of them. The object, however, would have ceased to be an object long before the state of quintessence was reached. And so according to some of them, increasing frequency scales could proceed to the point at which an object's full original form and mass could never be reconstituted, as in Kozura's experiments and Larson's RST. And so reviewing these various cosmological philosophies, as well as the anecdotal accounts, we can see that there exists a common theme concerning how different states of matter can be achieved through motion, be it rotation or vibration. Now for a little subjective empirical information concerning this. I've used the EZ bar in the gym regularly to work out my biceps. Now what's interesting is that a few times when removing the bar from the holder in order to load it with weight, I've accidentally bumped the bar into the rack. This would sometimes cause the EZ bar to vibrate at its own particular resonant frequency, at which point the 25 pound bar would feel briefly lighter. It's just barely perceptible and likely not something that would read out on an ordinary scale, but perceptible nonetheless. A similar sensation is sometimes felt with a strongly resonating tuning fork. I have yet to ask anyone else if they had similar experiences. If you've had, please take a moment to share your experiences in the comment section below. We've seen in the video Magneto Gravity Part 1 a cozy rough style experiment in which a uniform magnet weight with a north pole facing upwards was shown to have a different apparent weight than when its south pole was facing up due to each pole's interaction with the geomagnetic field. A non-magnetic object of the same mass and dimensions would have no interaction with the geomagnetic field and thus would represent a dry weight. But its magnetic counterpart would weigh slightly more on one side which we would call supergravity, and less on the opposite side, which we could call levity. Seeing the small but definitive results could give us confidence that more significant results could be achieved if a magnetic geomagnetic interaction system were properly scaled up. So it would be interesting to see if something similar could be achieved with vibration experiments. The first step would be to attempt an exact replication of Kozirov's experiments with everyday items. The next step would be to switch out the everyday items for objects which have known precise resonant frequencies such as tuning forks and glass goblets. Perhaps small blocks of quartz could be used as well. Crystalline quartz has a particularly uniform molecular, molecular structure made up of silicon dioxide. Thus, it should be fairly easy to determine its resonant frequencies. Solenoids or external speakers will supply the vibrations rather than heating or smashing, as in Kozura's original experiments. The next step would be to exchange the special Kozura scale with a modern, highly sensitive electronic scale to see if the weight changes still hold up. Additional steps would include using chords and harmonics instead of singular frequencies. And finally, a method would need to be found to accelerate the frequencies from the audio range to several orders higher in the attempt to generate coherent harmonic resonance at the molecular and atomic levels, as Kili is said to have done. After the basics are learned, more sophisticated techniques could be developed to affect much heavier masses, and perhaps even an acoustic wire could be fashioned after Keeley's Trexar. There's a lot up in the air at this point. Pardon the pun, but reports of others' replications of Kozura's results are hopeful. We recall that Kozura's results were obtained using different types of vibration, particularly heating and cooling, as there are functions of vibrations at different rates, and likely also mechanical vibrations in the range of 15 to 30 hertz. But in other experiments, he used manual shaking, which is akin to oscillation. For clarification, oscillation is defined as the rhythmic translational motion of a mass. The movement of the object itself as the 
as an external movement, usually in reference to objects outside of itself, whereas vibration is the rhythmic motion of an object within itself. This is defined by Del Pond, author of Universal Laws Never Before Revealed, an in-depth work of the theories of primarily John Worrell Keeley, but also Nikola Tesla and others. Now we could submit that structural oscillation could produce levity by envisioning a heavy mass oscillating in a vertical plane. If the moving mass could be grasped and lifted on the upstroke, then it would become lighter as it's being momentarily propelled upwards, but would quickly become heavier upon the downstroke. If a cyclical lifting effort is coincided with the upstroke arcs of the oscillation, then this could be somewhat practical, but still far from ideal. The low frequency oscillation will only generate a cyclical levity, as opposed to an overall levity that internal vibration has been said to produce. Whether those vibrations are of a less efficient brute force nature, nature as in Kozarev's experiments with smashing, heating, and cooling, etc., or of a finer nature as a, as a set of Keeler's experiments with extremely precise, high-frequency musical vibrations. It appears that in order to duplicate Keeler's results, we would need to vibrate a given mass at the molecular and atomic levels, and this will require a method of generating very high acoustic frequencies in the trillions of cycles per second. According to the liter literature on Keeley, he was able to accomplish this in at least a couple ways. One was the progressive resonators, and the other was via his unique gold, silver, and platinum wire, which apparently not only conducted the vibrations from the source to the mass, but was also able to greatly multiply those vibrations by many orders. Obviously a very sophisticated process. Yet again, there seems to be both experimental and empirical evidence, as well as perception of very small but definite weight changes in objects even with the much simpler methods, such as striking or oscillation. Concerning this weight loss perception, does it really point towards vibrating masses becoming lighter? Or is it merely a placebo-like psychosomatic effect? Perhaps this oscillating vibrating principle is similar in nature to a spinning flywheel at the end of a long shaft. Though the spinning disc doesn't register a net, net weight loss, it does, however, feel lighter as long as it is rotating at a high enough speed. Professor Eric Lathwaite, also known as the father of maglev, was one of the first people to conduct public demonstrations with gyroscopes. Lathwaite spun a flywheel weighing about 40 pounds, which he, prior to activation, had some difficulty in lifting above shoulder level with both arms. Yet when spinning it at 2,500 RPM, the flywheel at the end of a three-foot-long shaft could be easily raised overhead with only one arm in a fluid-lifting movement. This phenomenon is explained in terms of conservation of angular momentum as follows. When the apparatus is stationary and held by a shaft, the mass of the flywheel creates a torque acting downwards. To balance this, an opposite torque needs to be applied by an external force. However, when spinning, the torque due to its mass makes it process rather than fall to the ground. Therefore, no counter torque is required, only a force equal to the wheel's raw weight. A more detailed explanation says that things that are spinning have angular momentum that keeps them spinning in the same direction or plane. So if they start off spinning vertically, they'll stay vertical as long as they're spinning fast enough. And if they start off spinning horizontally, they'll stay that way until their spin slows down. Once it does slow down, the angular momentum is no longer strong enough to overcome gravity's pull, and so the wheel falls over. Spinning wheels are called gyroscopes. Because they always try to stay in the same direction, gyroscopes are used in autopilots for planes and anti-rocking devices for ships. Let's look at the following picture. Basically what is being said in these two explanations is that a heavy disc at the end of a long shaft generates a torque about the pivot point which is in the hand. 
This is also understood as a moment. In order to hold it horizontally with both hands as shown via the arrows, one has to exert an upward force on the shaft with one hand while exerting a downward force on the part of the shaft farthest from the weight. If holding the end of the shaft with only one hand, however, a tremendous amount of strength will be required, which will be physically impossible for all but the strongest forearm muscles and grip masters on the planet. However, when the wheel is spinning at sufficient speed, then this torque will be redirected into a processional movement as shown. As it says here, to conserve angular momentum, the gyroscope processes. This procession adds to the existing vertical component of angular momentum that arises from the gyroscope spinning, maintaining the original vertical component of angular momentum. So the normally down downward directed torque is temporarily eliminated or redirected, but the overall weight remains the same. Hence the strength required to hold up the raw weight of the contraption also should not change. However, looking back at the video with Professor Lakewaite, we can see that he has to exert some decent effort just to lift the 40 pound apparatus a few inches off the ground to shoulder level with both arms when it's not spinning. Yet he appears to have no difficulty at all in lifting the entire apparatus with one arm as long as the flywheel is spinning and again with what appears to be very little to no effort. Lifting a 40 pound weight in this manner will cause significant stress and discomfort in the arm of someone with little training and conditioning. Watch it again, but Lathwick proves the lack of strain by speaking comfortably during the entire motion. The spinning wheel, so far, and considering the conventional explanation, the one would think that the effort in lifting the apparatus would still have been a challenge as the raw weight of the device did not change. A video entitled Anti-Gravity Will Explain on the YouTube channel Veritasium shows that there is no net change in weight when lifting a heavy spinning gyroscope, yet the dry weight is demonstrably easier to lift. How is this possible? Is the perception of the lack of needed exertion in these experiments again only psychosomatic, a type of placebo effect in which the strength of the experimenter is somehow temporarily increased? or the perception of the biomechanical stress substantially mitigated? Or is there something a little more going on with gyroscopes and flywheels than just conservation of angular momentum? Could experiments with much heavier spinning gyroscopes weighing up to 90 pounds or more help to answer these questions? It would seem that if we made a stationary gyroscope that is heavy enough that it cannot be normally lifted, but which is suddenly able to be lifted when spinning, then this might be concrete, concrete proof of something more at work than the conventional explanation. Either way, it would certainly be an interesting experiment. According to the summum principle of vibration, Kozarev's causal mechanics, and Dewey Larson's reciprocal theory, all phenomena ultimately boil down to motion, rather rotation or vibration. In fact, vibration and rotation complement each other. Vibration produces rotation and rotation vibration. But of course we can't spin a huge block of stone in the same, same manner that we would a flywheel to see if it would make it easier to move or lift. But what if we instead vibrated the stone at resonance such that its particles are in harmonic coherence? a state which would theoretically cause them to vibrate and spin at a much higher energy level. Will they in effect be behaving as trillions of very tiny flywheels, with conservation of angular momentum being able to generate a similar perception of or effect of levity as it does in a large single flywheel? Or are the aforementioned cosmological theories correct in that a mass vibrating at harmonic coherence is literally, temporarily, crossing over into a parallel reality, thus losing a portion of its apparent weight. Is any of this partial teleportation also occurring with the molecules in a singular, large flywheel leading to its perceived loss of dry weight? If either of these is indeed the case, then it would appear that true anti-gravity and teleportation 
are intrinsically linked. But could something as simple as rotation and vibration really achieve such things? Certainly much more work needs to be conducted in this area in order for us to better understand the unfathomably complex reality or realities in which we live. A continued discussion of, on this subject, as well as the results of the vibration weighing experiments and the heavy gyroscope will be forthcoming in a pair of future videos. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and as always, stay tuned.